Welcome to Parliamento YouTube series conducted by Sri Lanka Press Institute. With the objective of educating youth on the role of parliament. And welcome to the second episode on the English series where today we're going to discuss about the role of parliament about sustainable development. Now when talking about sustainable development we all know that this is a widely spoken about topic in the discourse of development. And we know the parliament, the place where the laws of the country are made, is empowered to make decisions on sustainable development and to implement them. So in today's discussion, we're going to focus on sustainable development and the role of parliament in ensuring that the country goes in the right direction in its journey of sustainable development. And to have this discussion today, we have Dr. Rami Fernando. And to introduce him, he is the chairman and CEO of Global Strategic Corporate Sustainability Private Limited. And he's also a board member of the UN Global Compact Network Sri Lanka. He also serves in eight boards of top performing corporates in the country. And he is a true practitioner of sustainable development. Hello to you, Dr. Ravi Fernando. Hi. Welcome Ashi. to the Parliamento YouTube series. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on this program. Pleasure to have you and the honor is mine, sir. <laughs> Thank you. To start of the conversation, I would like to ask you, now it's important for all of us, not just for the youth, to everyone who's watching this to understand the difference between sustainable development and development. So let's just lay the foundation by giving out the definition. You're right. So the term sustainable development was first used in the world in 1987, mm -hmm. where the United Nations commissioned the Brundtland Report, uh, mm -hmm. the Prime Minister of Norway, and she coined the term sustainable development for the first time and sustainable development is defined as development that meets the needs of the present mm -hmm. without compromising the needs of the future. Mm. And in other words, compromising the needs of future generations. Now, what has happened in development prior to that, prior to 1987, people just continuously develop using up finite resources mm -hmm. and then found that we were running out of resources mm. and as a result of that future generations were obviously left without the resources that should have been left for them. Mm. So the major difference between development and sustainable development mm. is sustainable development focuses on the management of resources in such a manner that there will be adequate resources, regenerable re resources, so that in the future, future generations will also have them. Mm -hmm. So that would be my uh, simple answer to mm -hmm. the difference between the two. But I must also mention that majority of the development in the world today mm -hmm. is development at, in terms of economic growth, mm -hmm. as opposed to sustainable development which looks at economic, environmental, and social issues. Mm. Thank you so much for that answer, sir. And I would like to ask you now, this sustainable development is a concept that came into practice. But before this whole term of, you know, these are big words that come in as big concepts and theories at times. But is this a foreign concept that came into Sri Lanka? Or in Sri Lanka, did we have this practice in the past in other terms? I think it's an excellent question, Ashi, because... Sri Lanka and Asia mm -hmm. have had leaders who have practiced sustainable development even though it was not called sustainable development. That's right. I would say going back to the 11th century. Mm -hmm. So even as far back as 1135, 1147 when King Parakramubahu was leading the country, mm -hmm. he already had strategies for sustainable development. Mm -hmm. So I must say even though in 1987 everyone started talking about sustainable development, to a lot of Asian civilizations, mm -hmm. which are, you know, Sri Lanka has a history of nearly 2,500 years, mm -hmm. 
we've had sustainable development ingrained in our systems, ingrained in our policies, ingrained in national development. But unfortunately, even national leaders globally have basically ignored some of those teachings and some of those key principles of sustainable development. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And we all know in 2000, United Nations introduced the UN SDGs. There are 17 UN SDGs and we would like to know why were they introduced in 2000? And also coming into talking about our country, have we adopted them into the system or how does it work? Okay, so let me give a little bit of history here. Sure. In 2000, Kofi Annan, who was then the UN Secretary General, mm -hmm. began to realize that the world was going in a very wrong direction mm -hmm. because most nations were measured in terms of GDP growth. Right, yes. And GDP growth is probably the worst indicator if you only, because it, GDP growth measures only economic, economic. development. Mm. And he wanted to bring sustainable development into the system, mm -hmm. which meant that when a country is measured, you also look at its environmental development and its environmental resource management mm -hmm. and also social development, social progress of the population. Mm -hmm. So we call that the triple bottom line, yeah. right, of economic, environmental and social or people, planet and profit. So basically what the Kofi Annan did was launched at that time in 2000, what was known as the Millennium Development Goals. Mm -hmm. And there were only eight goals. Right. So he kept them for 15 years, between 2000 and 2015. And sadly, out of the eight goals, they only achieved two of them. Mm -hmm. In other words, six of them were not achieved. Uh, yeah. So then in 2015, when they had the Paris Agreement, they actually increased the number of goals from eight goals to 17 goals. Now, uh, I would have thought if you achieve two out of six, maybe the next time round you might maybe <laughs> really? look at a lower figure to go for. Yeah. So now there are 17 goals and in terms of these 17 goals, uh, most countries now have to report progress versus these 17 goals. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, because people haven't really understood the term sustainability and sustainable development well enough, mm -hmm. people have seen this as a tick in the box exercise. Mm -hmm. And everyone wants to simply say, did something, did something, did something, and they're ticking the box on 17 goals. Mm -hmm. And my understanding of this whole subject is that majority of the nations are falling backwards on sustainable development. And a, a research was published in 2020 okay. by the United Nations Environmental Program, which showed that in terms of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals by 2020, mm -hmm. which they were launched in 2015, they should have been achieving almost 100% of what should have been achieved by 2020. Mm -hmm. But they were 67% off the target for what they should have achieved in 2020, okay. which means for us to achieve the sustainable development goals now, we have to achieve first the 70% that we missed right. and then achieve 100% of the goals between 2020 and 2030. Mm. In, in achieving all of that now, out of the 17, as you are a practitioner and a specialist in this sustainable development subject, what are some of the priority goals that we can implement in any country or any system? Excellent. I think the... For me to explain the priority goals, I need to give you a bit of background as to what the world is facing today. Mm. Today, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, mm -hmm. in the 2020 UN General Assembly said that the world is facing a code red for humanity. Mm. That code red for humanity is where global temperatures are rising at an unprecedented level and if you look at the last 22 years since the year 2000, 21 of those years were the, were the years with the highest temperatures ever recorded in the last 3 million years. Oh, okay. So the planet is getting warmer and as a result of the planet getting warmer, we have extreme weather incidents all over the world, mm -hmm. like hurricanes, like 
droughts, like sea level rise, like uh, unprecedented rainfall. Mm. So extreme weather incidents are precipitated by the launch of, by, by the heating of the planet, mm -hmm. global warming. Now, the question is, what is causing global warming? Yeah. So that is really the, the main story that we have to talk about. Global warming is caused because countries have continuously burnt fossil fuels, mm -hmm. coal, petroleum, diesel, and natural gas are all known as fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And this burning of fossil fuels is what has caused the extreme weather incidents in the world and the temperatures to rise. Mm -hmm. So basically we have seen in 1987 when the Brundtland report was written, they said every country must exit fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And they actually set a target of trying to exit it by 2000. Mm -hmm. Then in 2000 when they met, they said we'll exit it by 2030. Yeah. And then they met in 2020 and said, let's exit it in 2050. Yeah. Now, and some countries are saying we'll exit it in 2070. To me, this is basically a confirmation that a majority of national leaders and world leaders, whatever country they are in, have no understanding of what is sustainable development and the urgency to exit fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So, the priority goals, goal number seven, exit fossil fuels and go to renewable energy, should be the one goal every country in the planet should be focused on. That's right. If we don't fix that, fixing everything else is not going to help the planet hmm. because we will succumb to the crisis of the planet. Hmm. Goal number 12 is sustainable consumption. Hmm. Sustainable consumption is you can't just consume things and put it into the sea and put it into the landfill and then say we have sustainable consumption. Consumption mm -hmm. is a circular economy. Yeah. These are the two priority goals that every country should focus on. And I would say every nation should be measured on their performance on these two goals. Mm -hmm. Because the faster we go to renewable energy, the faster we have sustainable consumption, the better the planet will be. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the two goals that I have explained in detail, Ashi, there are three other priority goals in my mind. Now mm -hmm. I must mention this is my view, yeah. personal view, and it is not the view of any of the organizations I work in. Mm -hmm. Goal number nine is important because nations have to go for sustainable innovation. Mm -hmm. Not just innovation, but sustainable innovation mm -hmm. where you contribute to sustainability and contribute to the regeneration of of uh, main uh, uh, resources mm -hmm. in terms of sustainable development. Mm -hmm. The other two goals that are very important is one is goal number 15. Goal number 15 is to do with rainforest cover, forest cover of the world. Mm -hmm. The world has destroyed 75% of all the forest cover in the world. We are left with 25%. Mm -hmm. In the case of Sri Lanka, we have destroyed more than that. We are only left with 16%. Mm -hmm. So reforesting, conservation of forest cover is goal 15. If you don't do goal 15, you won't have water. Mm. Because the rain cycle is when trees exude oxygen and that oxygen links up with the hydrogen in the atmosphere. Then you have H2O, also known as water. Yes. Now if you cut all the trees, then you will not have the rain cycle. Mm -hmm. So goal number 15 and goal number 4, which is to do with water, are the other two goals which are interlinked. Mm -hmm. You won't have water without trees and you can't have trees without water. Yes. So these are the five priority goals that I believe, personally, every nation, every business should focus on and have clear strategies to achieve. Now, according to your point of view, you say now these are five priority goals where every nation, every business should focus in. Where are we as Sri Lankans in this? Uh, are we following at least the prior set of priority uh, goals? Um, where exactly are we as Sri Lanka? Okay, so when I talk about Sri Lanka, I will talk about the general situation in the world also because okay. I can confess to you that Sri Lanka is not on its own when it comes to performance on the sustainable development goals. Right. So let's start with goal number seven, which mm -hmm. is go towards renewable energy. Mm -hmm. 
You know, in 1987, we said we must go for renewable energy. In 2022, only 30% of our energy is yet coming from renewable sources. Mm -hmm. In other words, 70% is coming from polluting fossil fuel sources, which is why our planet is in absolute jeopardy. Yeah. And we are talking of a climate emergency. Mm -hmm. So in goal seven, I would say European Union has done very well. They have moved very fast. They are close to 40%, 45%. Mm -hmm. Sri Lanka is yet at 30%. Mm -hmm. Uh, 29% of Sri Lanka's energy mix is coming from hydroelectricity. 1% mm -hmm. only is coming from solar power. Mm -hmm. Now, that is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. In a country which has 365 days of sunlight, if our solar power is only 1%, mm -hmm. we should be harnessing solar power much more. Mm -hmm. But I know that the country has a goal of achieving 70% renewable energy by 2030, right. but it needs a strategy to do that. Mm -hmm. And I can see that we have a long way to go from 30% to 70%. I'm sure, yeah. When I look at sustainable consumption, I think most countries are failing on sustainable consumption. There's a lot of plastic pollution and a lot of single-use plastics in the world. And people yet haven't understood that pollution any country, any person be leaving pollution for someone else to sort out is not managing it. Yeah. So we, everyone is failing on, on, uh, on the 12th goal. Mm -hmm. On goal number nine, which is to do with sustainable innovation, again, the European Union is ahead of most nations. Mm -hmm. Sri Lanka is blessed with three amazing resources. And I have, uh, one of my roles, one of my last jobs was as the head of Slintech, the Sri Lanka Institute of Nanotechnology. I was the first head of Slintech. And when I was do, head, heading Slintech, I identified three resources. One is titanium, mm -hmm. one is graphite, and one is phosphate. Okay. These three resources are today the most needed resources in the world. Graphite and graphene is known as the toughest material on the planet, 200 times stronger than uh, iron. Mm -hmm. So we have graphite in Sri Lanka. We, we have, and sustainable innovation is putting those innovations into economic value creation, which is something Sri Lanka should be doing. And I can tell you, as at today, there is a long way to go. Yeah. We have a little bit of work happening in graphene with one of the companies I'm involved in. When I look at goal number 15 and 4, most countries have destroyed their green cover. Most countries have destroyed their forest cover. And they seem to think that this is development. This is not, de this is development, yes, but it is not sustainable development. Mm -hmm. Because that's what happened to the Middle East. Do you know how many days it rains in the Middle East? Mm -hmm. Six days a year. Why? What is common about the Middle East? Most of the Middle East is a desert. desert. Why? Because they chopped off all their trees. Yeah. So if you don't have tree cover, you will not have rain and you will not have uh, verdant forest cover and flora and flora. There was a time that Lebanon, for example, had one of the biggest forest covers in the world. They, you, people referred to the cedars of Lebanon. And unfortunately, during the Egyptian time, they cut all these trees down to make boats. Now they have boats and no trees. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that sustainable development is also protecting your forest cover. We must protect the minimum of 30% of our forest cover if we are to achieve sustainable development. Sri Lanka's forest cover is now down to 16%. So there's a massive job to increase that from 16% to 30%. Of course. And then hold it at 30% and grow forward. So, these are the five goals, and I've given you a very quick analysis of where Sri Lanka is on mm -hmm. some of these goals. Yeah. Um, I honestly believe that Sri Lanka should focus on these goals and first get them right. Mm. And the most important goal at this point in time for Sri Lanka yeah. is getting goal seven right, which is renewable energy. energy. Because... If Sri Lanka had driven the renewable energy agenda 10 years ago, we wouldn't be having petrol requirements, we wouldn't be having diesel queues, because we would have had renewable energy solutions for all our energy needs. Exactly. Sri Lanka should be 100% renewable energy driven nation. And we have now 
advanced solar panels, advanced solar batteries. We can, we can use floating solar. Sri Lanka has 30,000 water bodies and 103 rivers. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we have enough and more space to put yeah. floating solar in these areas. And uh, the new combination is wind power, solar power with batteries, which can store the energy in the mornings and use it in the nights. Mm. This is the future that Sri Lanka should be looking at. And if, if you ask me, Ashi, what is the most important goal every country on the planet should focus on? It is goal number seven and moving to renewable energy. energy. BBC report dated 28th August mm -hmm. 2022 says that the world's Arctic the solar polar caps, which is the Arctic and the Antarctic, have melted faster than they had expected. Oh. And we are now looking at a 27 centimeter increase in sea levels all over the world. I can tell you the most vulnerable nations to sea level rise are those nations which are island nations. And majority of the southern hemisphere nations, Sri Lanka is already in the top 10 most vulnerable nations to climate emergency. Yeah. So, this is not some joke, this is not some uh, story I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. If leaders understood sustainability and understood what the UN Secretary General is saying mm -hmm. in terms of a code red for humanity, then all leaders whether they are business leaders, national leaders, That's right. or any leader, should be addressing that issue. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's where I'm trying to hit the conversation next into, sir. Uh, no matter how educated or how much you know about the subject, you, you might know a lot about it, but it's also about applying it and taking the right <coughs> decision. And the leaders have a big role to be played here as well. Now, I would like to ask you, what is the concept of legislation in the framework of sustainable development and how practical it is? Okay, so since the year 2000, yes. like I already mentioned to you, every nation has to report on sustainable development yeah. and the goals. Yes. So, there is now embedded in, in the legislative frameworks of mm -hmm. Sri Lanka and every country in the planet this commitment that 296 countries signed mm. in June, in, this, in November 2015 in Paris mm -hmm. and said, we will commit to sustainable development goals. We will commit to achieving 80% of our renewable energy goals by 2030. Mm -hmm. And every country, it is already in the legislative framework. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a big difference between having something in a legislative framework and having leaders who understand it and then having leaders who translate that understanding into actions that impact sustainable right, development. Yeah. So there's a massive gap between <laughs> having legislative, uh, having laws in place, mm -hmm. having it embedded in the legislative frameworks having nations delivering and reporting because the easiest thing on the planet is to report something and simply say I didn't do it or I did it. Reporting progress is another story, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So I think the first, the answer to your question is the legislative framework in terms of sustainable development since 2000 and 2015 when all nations signed to it mm -hmm. have been basically committed. Mm -hmm. And every nation is supposed to report on sustainable development progress every quarter. Mm -hmm. But I already gave you a figure. I said, as at 2020, nations are 67% of the target. So what it's telling you and telling me <laughs> is though there are targets, though there are goals, though there are commitments, that the amount of attention paid to achieving them mm -hmm has not been done yeah. and there aren't really and this is not a criticism of Sri Lanka only yeah. this is of the whole world I the 67 percent off target is the whole world yeah. is off the target yeah. 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 Right. right so legislative you can always have laws but getting laws into action and action into 
real impactful action is two different things. Yeah. According to your point of view, coming into talking about the role of the parliament, because that's where the laws are being made, what can the parliamentarians do to get the sustainable development straightened now? Okay, so what I'm saying now is general to all parliaments in the world. Mm -hmm. Who is a parliamentarian? A parliamentarian is supposed to be a leader who is representing the interests mm -hmm. of his or her constituents at the parliament. Now, in other words, the parliamentarians are the ones who should be most concerned about sustainable development <laughs> yes. and most worried about doing the right things in the parliament and making sure that they are looking after the interests of the public, right. interests of the people. Mm -hmm. So are they doing that? Mm -hmm. To my mind, there are three essential priorities of any parliamentarian anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. The first essential fact of a parliamentarian is he or she should first spend time and understand sustainable development mm. and understand what is required in sustainable development, especially in terms of those five goals. Mm -hmm. And having understood, he or she should first practice those goals for himself or for herself. Right. Because no one can ever achieve any sustainable development if they are not walking the talk. Mm -hmm. They must walk the talk. And you cannot talk if you are not walking the talk. That's right. So I believe that the first thing is parliamentarians must understand the goals, must practice those goals in their own homes, mm -hmm. and then start legislating, bringing legislation into the country, mm -hmm. which help those countries to move forward in sustainable development. And third element is the parliament itself should be a place where the world can look at and say, wow, they're practicing. This is a place where sustainable development is being practiced. That's right. Okay. Yes. So if I take each of those three goals, I'll start with the very first one. Mm -hmm. What percentage of parliamentarians in the world do I think are today understanding the concept of sustainable development? My answer to that would be, why is it that uh, the world is so far off the target on sustainable development? <laughs> to me, this is a confirmation that the majority of parliamentarians in the world haven't understood, haven't understood sustainable development and the core dread for humanity. This I'm is sure. my gut feel. I'm sure. Because <laughs> the first thing about a 21st century leader is they must understand things through the eyes of science. Mm. I'm not saying that all parliamentarians should be scientists, That's but right. all parliamentarians should have an understanding of science, mm -hmm. should have a respect for science, and should be looking at what is happening in the world today in terms of global warming, sea level rise, destruction of the planet. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, all I can say is, before I start preaching the subject of sustainable development, I have asked myself the question, what can I do in my own situation? Mm. I have already shown you in yes. this home, I have put 100% solar panels and we are 100% driven by renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Is the homes of all our parliamentarians in the world, are they driven 100% by renewable energy is my first question. Mm. Second question is, I have made sure my transportation is either hybrid or electric. Mm. How many parliamentarians in the world are today driving and going about in hybrid vehicles or in electric vehicles? Mm -hmm. What's the answer? I don't know the answer. But I can take a safe bet that 90% of them are not going in hybrid vehicles right. and 90% are going in polluting fossil fuel vehicles, which are sp spewing out a lot of carbon emissions in terms of diesel vehicles and mm -hmm. petrol vehicles. Mm -hmm. First, you have to practice the subject. That's right. Now the next question is, what are we doing in the parliament? Today, 
in all the parliaments in the world, what percentage of parliaments are 100% run by renewable energy? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have heard people saying, but if we put solar panels on top of our parliament, it might look very ugly. <laughs> are we worried about ugly or are we worried about saving the people of the planet? We have to get our priorities very right, clear. Yeah. This is not about, this is not a beauty contest. This is a contest to save the people of the planet. Hmm. And we have to be serious about this, right? So I think every parliamentarian has to practice sustainable development. Hmm. Second thing is, I talked about the five goals. Yes. I would say every parliamentarian should ask in their constituency, whichever town they work in, whichever community they work in, whichever cabinet position they have, have they practiced sustainable development for the five goals? Mm -hmm. Have they got the renewable energy sorted out? Have they got sustainable consumption sorted out? Are we yet using plastic water bottles in parliament? That should be banned. Yeah. How can you have plastic water bottles in a parliament? If you are talking about sustainable development, have we got sustainable innovation for Sri Lanka or for the, any country in the world? Mm. Have we increased our forest cover? In our constituent, in our area, in our town, in our district, mm. have we increased forest cover or are we destroying forest cover? Yeah. How, how well are we managing our water resources? So I would say the responsibility of any parliamentarian in any country in the world is to practice these five areas first in their home, Second, in their constituent, C. Third, in the country. Hmm. It's no point parliamentarians walk, talking about sustainable development and how committed they are to sustainable development if they are driving around in diesel vehicles and if their homes aren't, have yet not gone into 100% renewable energy. Hmm. And the That's parliament right. should be going for renewable energy. We can put floating solar if they don't want to destroy the look of the parliament. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Floating solar is there. Devanna is next to it. We should be having 100% energy coming from floating solar. Mm -hmm. So to me, there is a huge requirement for the nation to educate on one side mm -hmm. its leadership. Mm. And when I talk of national leadership, we talk of parliamentarians, cabinet ministers mm -hmm. in every country in the world. This is not uh, only talking about Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. We need to get business leaders, parliamentarians, cabinet leaders, all understanding sustainable development. Mm -hmm. That's right. They should all be given also a simple lesson on science 101. Mm. We must realize that if you don't respect science, the danger is your country will dis be destroyed by leaders who have ignored science. Mm. And I can name many countries which have got destroyed because of that. So one country that has got destroyed because its leader didn't respect science is Brazil. Mm. Brazil was, until recently, 20% of the world's oxygen because of the Amazon rainforest. Do you know in the last five years, Brazil has destroyed the Amazon race for us to an extent that Brazil today doesn't give even 1% of oxygen to the planet anymore. Why? Because it had a leader who decided that they must cut down the Amazon forest and start planting soya beans. And this is a country which ignored science even when there was COVID-19. Yeah. So the two countries which have the highest number of COVID deaths USA and Brazil. At that time, both countries, the leadership ignored science. Mm. So I would say all leaders, including the younger generation of the world, should be all educated on simple science. That's right. Because if we ignore science, we are going to ruin ourselves mm -hmm. in the process. Number two, Every one of them should be educated on the subject of sustainable development. Mm -hmm. And let me give you a simple lesson now. Sustainable development is where you have an economic growth model mm -hmm. 
which is driving economic growth through sustainable innovation, but ensures that you don't sacrifice your environmental resources as you achieve economic growth, mm -hmm. that you regenerate your environmental resources in terms of tree cover, forest cover, protect them. And the third element of sustainable development is that as a result of this economic growth model, which is not harming the planet, mm -hmm. which is protecting the planet, you must also ensure that the livelihood of people and the progress of human beings is also happening at the same time. Mm. Today, the world is in a very strange situation. 1% of the world's population control 52% of the world's resources. That's right, yes. 99% <laughs> have the balance 48. The bottom 40%, 30% have under 0.5%. So we have an extremely unfair inequality in the world today. So even if people say we are committed to sustainable development in terms of planet and environment and committed to sustainable development in terms of economic growth, if we drop the ball on people, then we have dropped the ball on all three. Mm -hmm. And there is a massive need for the poorer people of the world to have equal uh, benefits in terms of economic growth. Mm -hmm. It's no point only 1% benefiting from all economic growth. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope everyone listening in, especially the younger generation, and any future parliamentarian who wants to be a future parliamentarian or a business leader, understand the need for learning science and for need for educating yourself on what is sustainable development. That is definitely a very fruitful answer, sir. Thank you so much for setting the ground. I think throughout this discussion, we've been uh, telling you the importance of sustainable development and what exactly is sustainable development. And uh, we brought forward examples from the globe and where the world also has to lead. And we also brought forward United Nations uh, Sustainability Development Goals. And you mentioned about your point of view on priority goals out of them and the role of parliament, the role of leaders and the parliamentarians. And coming into the latter part of the discussion, I think it's important to understand, sir, the role for the common men and the women of the country, especially uh, the ones who are watching. What can we do? Yes, the leaders, they have a role, but we should stop. I think now as Sri Lankans, we have all stopped blaming the leaders for taking uh, decisions and authorities, but we have trying to take action for our, be responsible for our own actions. So what can we do? What can the common men of the country do to take the country forward in sustainable <coughs> development? The little action that you can suggest. So I can see two actions. Yeah. First action is what I said at the beginning of the session today. That family, that person must ask the question, am I living a sustainable life? Mm -hmm. How is my home powered? How am I using forest cover? Am I contributing to forest cover or destruction or not? Mm -hmm. So firstly, every single one of you must be a leader in your home, must be a leader in your environment, mm -hmm. in your place of work. Because at the end of the day, easy thing is for us to blame all the leaders. Mm -hmm. and. Actually, you must, the so second question is, who is voting the leaders into power? Mm -hmm. Next time, you make a decision to vote for anyone to be a parliamentarian. The first question you should ask is, is that parliamentarian understanding and committed to basic science? Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, vote for them. If the answer is no, you have to find a parliamentarian who understands and who talks about science. That's right. Because if they don't talk about science and they say, I will cut down all these trees and I will give you all this land and you can grow vegetables, mm -hmm. when the country's uh, tree cover is already at 16%, then you're going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. So first thing is, think carefully about a leader that you vote for who understands science. Mm -hmm. Because finally, the leaders you get 
are the leaders you vote for. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you don't make a wrong decision. The leader must understand science and understand sustainable development. Yeah. So what can we do? In our own homes, I think we have to take extra, extra effort to not waste anything that we have on the table. We must make sure that in our homes, we go for renewable energy as fast as we can. Because if we don't do that, we are then part of the problem of global warming. Mm -hmm. And how you manage your resources that you have will give a signal to every one of your neighbors, every one of your friends, how conscious you are about how you manage resources. Mm -hmm. Are you keeping your lights on? Are you putting lights off? Are you, are you saving the rainwater that comes? Are you using that rainwater well? Are you buying thousands and thousands of clothes or are you able to reuse mm -hmm. the clothes you have? Have you stopped using plastic in your own home? So there are things that every single one of us must do mm -hmm. if we are serious about sustainable development. Mm -hmm. And no point talking about sustainable development. I am saying what is important is walking the talk. That's right. There are enough people who talk the walk. Mm -hmm. And I have come across thousands of these people. I am telling you, differentiate between someone who is talking the walk and someone who is walking the talk. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ravi Fernando, for giving out all of this information. And it was a very fruitful conversation. And I think the process starts from us, from you and I, and from all of us, before blaming the authorities, before blaming the leaders. I think uh, if we start the change, I think we are setting an example. Um, some, sometimes we see when we go to supermarkets and groceries, people don't start saying no to plastics, you know, yeah. take your own bag. I think that's a place where the change can start. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's, that's a place that we can all start and make a change in the world so that you and I have a world to live and our future generations have a world to live, a planet to live on. And um, to bring the discussion into a close, I would also like to talk a little bit about the book that is to be launched by you, sir, The 21st Century Leadership to Fight the Code Red for Business to be launched uh, in a few months, I guess if you would like to say a little bit about it. Yes. So one, one thing I have realized mm -hmm. is that today the world, even though we are in the 21st century, mm -hmm. is led by mostly 19th century science denying leaders. Mm -hmm. So if we continue letting 19th century science denying leaders in countries, in businesses, in uh, organizations to lead this world mm -hmm. and to lead the businesses and to lead the countries, we are going to have a massive code rate for humanity, mm -hmm. which is what this book is all about. Yeah. And the code rate for humanity will destroy 60 to 70 percent of global GDP. Mm -hmm. So global GDP now is 100 trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. If you lose 70%, you'll be left with a $30 trillion GDP, mm -hmm. which means every country's GDP will reduce by 70% in the next three to five years if everyone doesn't behave in a different manner. That's right. So this book is about creating 21st century leaders who respect science and who know that their strategy has to be built on science, mm -hmm. whether it's for the home or whether it's for the business or whether it's for the country. Everyone has to have a strategy how you do things. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that they have an urgency to impact the climate emergency. Mm -hmm. They can't say, let's do this by 2070, let's do it by 2050, because we don't probably have time after 2025 mm -hmm. to do things. Yeah. Thirdly, they must be triple bottom line thinkers. That's right. And lastly, they must bring this subject to the agenda, whether it's the national agenda, the business agenda, the political agenda. These subjects have to be brought into the agenda. So this book is trying to create 21st century leaders. And we are launching it in Luxembourg in November this year. Mm -hmm. And this book will be available on Amazon and all these places later on. But the key message I want to give to the whole world who's anyone listening to this is 
we cannot be 19th century leaders running the 21st century. Mm -hmm. We have to be 21st century leaders understanding the reality the world is faced with mm -hmm. and impact it with every bit of energy that we have. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi Fernando, for joining with the Parliamento interview series and giving out the best in talking about sustainability and the role of Parliament in Sri Lanka. And you brought in examples from the world as well. Your expertise is much appreciated. And the pleasure and honor was definitely mine in interviewing you today. Thank you so much for joining with us, sir. Thank you very much for having me. And for all of you who are watching, thank you so much for joining with the Parliamento series. As you know, today we spoke with Dr. Ravi Fernando, the chairman and CEO of Global Strategic Corporate Sustainability Private Limited. And please follow us, subscribe, comment and like all our videos. And we would like to know your point of view as well because we would like to give you the chance to hear your point of view, your ideas and what do you think that we can do to go forward and take this country to a better place. Stay tuned for our next episode on Parliamento interview series. Thank you for watching. See you soon.